you'll find in this room will be quite warm. Temperature outside. Hitting or pressing or rubbing. Okay, so these ones, they're the worst if you start rubbing them into your hair. These ones here, you press them. I'm sorry, there's another rubber. That's why you can press. Get that out here. And once I start to rub, see if I press, it takes a long time. As soon as I rub, it attach straight away. Because I start to rub, it gets me into the pressure point quicker. Pressure points are on a light switch, which attack the nervous system, and they work in Thai boxing as well. So now I use the point of my elbow to attack the pressure point here. So I take hold of the head and I press in there. I take hold of the, get up on the other side of here, any way I possibly can, pushing, shoving. Once that's in there, you're pushing the head against the front, against the front. If he's smart, he'll be pulling back. He's going to lift his head back, which might nullifies me, start to nullify me. If I wait too long, I can't do anything because I can't get over the top of this bridge. He's bridging and nullified me out. That's how you nullify grappling. So I'm trying to get in here and pull his head forward by pushing down his shoulder and giving his gap and pulling his head down. Then I can get up into here. If he bridges and gets in between my legs and bridges back, I can't do it. I can't get in there. He's nullified me. So we let him move out and start again. You know, get into here and get to there. Confident, go up to there. Fully confident, come around to here. Take hold of the wrist. Both elbows are in the holes now. I'm on both pressure points. Now, if I squeeze his neck that way, I'll start to choke him out because I'm pulling that hand in, digging in and pulling in on his neck. Now, if I pull him forward and twist him, I'm starting to use his neck to twist him. That opens him up to get the knees working. Pull him back the other way, blitz. In this way. If you put the elbow down, then when I blitz, I come over and strike into his arm over the top. That's not bad, yeah? Right. You're lying, bro. If I respect the honour there, if Rod Strad did that, he wouldn't be saying it's okay, he'd be on one knee with a coffin. He's <laughs> awesome when he does this, he brings it over and just corks in on me. I'm practicing right now. This one of my, this one of my very dear friends. I like to practice that. How, how am I doing? <laughs> Concept. See, you can take it out, and you lift it, and then you roll it, and then you bring it straight in. Now to do that, you've got to go out. So you get in and bridge. Once you're in, then you have to open, twist or anything to get an opening. Once you get, I do foot replacement. Kick that foot out. See, this foot kicks that foot out. And as that foot kicks that foot out, I come up as high as I can. Once I get up as high as I can and out to the back, he doesn't know what's going on. He's too busy kicking over these holes. Your elbows digging into his shoulders here. And once I put it in place and get it up, then I can come in. Boom! Once you pull, once you pull at the same time, see what I'm doing there? Boom! I can't do that to a friend. I only gave him the knee by itself. I left the arms where they were. What were we doing then? Because he didn't feel the heavy jerk on the neck, did you? He only felt a solid belt on his arm because I was just using my leg. Because he's a friend. So to make it work correctly and effectively, you pull the head at the same time. You now, if you, you could do that, see the difference? <laughs> <laughs> Just a love tap. I didn't drive it in, but I wanted to feel as good that makes. Uh, pairing up, let's just try Thai style grappling. Nothing else. Just one hand, other hand, in the air, pushing. Just below the thumb. Go top of the wrist, just below the thumb. Is he doing that for me? Uh, no. I didn't think he was either. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I come up with my left hand, and then I come through. Now, what you find, am I doing it right? As I explain it, I'm in here, now he does it. And he, so what he does is breaks my grip. Now he's got the advantage. Now when he gets the advantage tie style, I've got to go back in again. So I'm underneath and he's on top. Because now I'm resting. I'm resting now. He's got to fight to get suits. Because I can let a knee go any time, he can't. So he hasn't got the strength. He can't pull me in. And if he uses a knee, I can flip him off really easily. Or I can control him. Or I can let a knee go at any time. So he's, he's, I'm much more better balanced than what he is, because I'm hanging on to something. Make sense? No knees, just hold the knee back and forward. As you get better at it, start to fight one another a bit. So he's coming in on me, and I fight him. So I drop that elbow on him. Once you drop that elbow on him, it's hard for him to get in. But if it's impossible, we're not having any fun now. So I let him in. Then I stop him from the other one. I bridge him out. So I'm bridging him out. But when it becomes impossible for him, if you can't get in, because that's all we're doing, you can't kick or punch on it, then I let him in. But I make him work. I rub it in, see? Now he's going to understand to do the same thing to me. Then he does it. And we're moving around, and that's the idea. Nothing else except alternating that grip. Now when you're in, make sure you've got hold of the wrist just below the thumb, and you go from the neck to the top of the head, and you have these on the right pressure points. And I'll go around and check too. When we can do that, then we advance it. When that's not that in, and you'll see it works. It bridges the grappling table. Just as an experienced fighter, just watch these two here. He grapple with him and he'll bridge. And just keep, keep the head up, keep the hips 
forward. Now, you're just going to breach. So go in, go in, and turn the body. Turn the body, and go in. So you're going to make hands at all. So you're going to make hands at all. He's coming on you. And then you just breach him. He's going to ride between his legs and turn. And you can get that underneath there, inside. Now, to put his hand down, so you're going to just put your shoulder in. Just put your shoulder in. That's it. So now, you nullify with this guy's strength that he had. That, that becomes European back then. The Thais don't do that much. The money was in the neck. And they could have a for a thousand years and they're all good at it. And the Dutch went, oh shit, can't compete with that. Let's do something slightly different. And that's where we created the European. Some Australian guy in the next four years, well, oh, let's be, make an Australian version. And it's quite possible that will come out. Okay, we're grappling in our Thai style, leading into European style by turning the body and nullifying you. You're locking against the elbow. See, I'm locking my shoulder against his forearm. And I'm getting ready for the other hand to come. Because I want to do the same thing to him. So it's a competition at this point here. If I feel he's superior, then you just lean on the arm, this way here, and just twist your head. Okay. Mm. So just a little push, even hanging on the arm that way, which is European style. Because I always start with European style before I go to Thai anyway. I'm teaching back this way, because I learned Thai first, then I learned European, but I like European better. This to me is much more effective for me. And also, you know, if you lose that a bit high, if you go to the top of the head, then I can chuck my chin down, and I can get under me, and then I can strike from here. Um, and then I want to finish just to push on the hip. So the tie's been a lot of neck off when we train them. They just push on the hip. They won't last forever. They don't want to make a tug of war or a wrestling match. So they'll do that just briefly to get something else happening. Then they'll do a maul across your face. But the, when, they, when he's coming in, they'll bridge it that way. So as he comes in to get around the neck, they just bridge it that way. What you do is you push in and down on the hip joint. Just below the band on the belt. So I'm hitting the socket there, yeah? That's what gives me that kickback. Just pushing on the pressure point there. Even the gloves on. Just the palm. Okay, I'll, I'll grab a thumb now, that's why the pressure got in there. He jerked back for me because it actually stuck the thumb in the pressure point. With a boxing glove on, you'll find the boxing glove's got a big pattern on the back of the thumb here, you few fighters, but there's only a thin layer of canvas. So without the referee knowing, you really can't start pressing the thumb through the canvas because there's only one layer on the inside of the thumb. There's two inches on the other side. But you really can use the thumb for different pressure points. If you practice with a boxing glove on, and before you go in, you, you rub, you pull it back and around, so you get a lot of sensitivity between just about one layer of canvas over the skin of the thumb. And you can start to dig into pressure points and dig in with no one knowing what you're doing, so this guy's jerking for you because you've got a dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you can do that, it doesn't look like the boxing glove, you have to do that with a boxing glove, but you can. And uh, I told me about this, that's one of Stephen Delphus as well. So you know who John, Big John? The Big John guys all this stuff from England. We never saw that in Thailand, we got that off the, off the pond. Excuse the expression. Uh, pushing out here, pushing out underneath. Reaching in, reaching in this way, so you lift your chin up as high as you can, put the hip into his hip, and stand up on the back toe. And that nullifies that out. Now, some of you are asking me what you do with this hand because you got into this position, so you're in trouble when you get into this position down here. You've got to start doing other stuff for shoot wrestling. You've got to start too and getting out this kind of way. Uh, if, you're, if you're getting grappled down here, like when you asked me the question before, see, I really should be more superior by like me bridging out. He's got my neck, so I'm bridging this way. So this hand is worth hanging down. Because I'm working on getting his hip into his hip, putting pressure on the back heel and pushing in him, just pushing in. Because he's pulling me back. Does it make sense? Now I'm trying to try and see with your eyes what we're doing now. So you understand this going to the Thai, between Thai and European. This is Thai. This is European. That's the bridge in the middle. That's the bridge over the river Kwai. Uh, okay, now we're going to European style. From here, pulling down to bring him this way. Stepping into the back foot and use his neck, so I'm pushing the palm. There's nothing wrong with that. I can use the crutch of my elbow and try and pull the side of his head off. That's legal. Before we're going to hit the same time. Now when I get a pull down and hit across, and we do them together, the foot, now I start getting swinging around. And at that point there, he's very vulnerable to this. Because I swung around to receive that. That's the pull down. It's sort of like, quite like keto. So I'm just totally relaxed. I'm making him work now. Because to get out of that side, don't swing him around, he's got to fight and try and change the position. And every time he tries to change the position, he's either got to take this off the back of my neck, that puts him in trouble. And if he does that, now I can elbow him in a fight. So you wouldn't do that. Or I can, you know, attack him with a punch. So you'll find that hand stays pretty locked. He's on my elbow. But I've got the advantage. Have I got the advantage? Why have I got the advantage? Because I'm taller and heavier. <laughs> We're both in exactly the same position. I'm probably laying a bit more of my wrist. He's got the fingers on my neck, sir. Look at my hand. I'm using the pressure of my forearm and hanging the hand there. He's working with stiff fingers. See the difference? That's why I thought I had an advantage. Make sense? Look at this hand here. He's got holding me. 
with his fingers and his wrists, and I'm laying on him. So if I want to suddenly whip back that way, we'll come in and push up that way. That's what I want to do. So that's the action from me. That's the action from me. It all comes off the same thing, just by staying in the European style. He's going to use all his strength to bridge back up again. I've lost it. Now he's got the advantage. That's what fighting's all about. That's what playing chess. So, Thai style, European style, the bridge in between the two. Now there's Japanese style, which comes in a more judo technique, but we won't touch on that for now. The Japanese style. Let's just work on uh, the two I've mentioned. But for the Thailand, we were taught. Karate from Japan. Karate is a Japanese word. Karate means empty hand. It comes from Japan. I was taught by a Polynesian, Tina Sabarana. He's a Polynesian Hawaiian. He speaks with an American accent and he taught me Japanese karate. <laughs> so I was taught to speak Japanese with an American accent. I went across to Japan, who are the most proper speaking people in the world except for the French and Germans, but I think the Japanese are slightly ahead of the Germans and the French for articulating their language. They must speak the language perfectly they get upset with themselves. They deliver the highest end of education on the planet today. The Americans are trailing way behind. The Japanese do have the highest end of education, but they're also the highest suicide rate on the planet trying to achieve that education. <laughs> 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 I'll stay down, James. Yeah. Sorry? I'll stay down. <laughs> they, have, they have no choice. They have to get smart or they die. Yeah. You know, you just, you just rip it up. And, you, know, you can't survive in Japan because it's uh, 85 Australian dollars to have a piece of tea bone steak. <laughs> So if you're not smart and cannot earn a living to acquire 85 Australian dollars just to have an Australian state, if we spend 9.95, we'll be too many. <laughs> 75 to 120 dollars in Tokyo for an Australian state or an American state. Uh, so uh, the point I'm making here is you have to make a lot of money to survive. There's only one race over there, very, very rich. The rest are dying somewhere. Why are we discussing that? Japanese culture as compared to Thailand culture. So you see now I'm giving the Zendo Kai people a little bit of history from Japan. Uh, a little bit of history from Thailand. We have written records of Siam around about Christ, around Julius Caesar's time. A lot of fighting styles were created, um, or we have history of them from around Julius Caesar's time. The dominated Roman of the period, uh, 54 years BC is when he wiped all the Celts out. We have a five year period, eight year period. By the year 54 BC, he almost killed as many. If they had been the same population, he would have killed more people than Hitler. To me, I read my history books and Julius Caesar was worse than Adolf Hitler. Because of the ratio of population, he killed a much bigger percentage of the planet. And if you are Australian descent from the United Kingdom, he killed your grandfathers. Not the one that turned him invisible against you in the Canadians here today. <laughs> from our wondrous Rome. But uh, it was Julius Caesar who killed our race. And he fought our race and battled them down through Spain, down through Portugal, across the lower England. He chased them across on his ships with our grandfathers and he put them all up into the highlands of Ireland and Scotland and Wales. And we sat there for two centuries to about 450 years ago when America was discovered. As Christopher Columbus discovered America, there was a potato family in Ireland. A lot of our ancestors left Ireland after being beaten down from central France. We come from France. We come from central Europe. Northern France, Gaul. It's where most United Kingdom people came from four or five grandfathers before Julius Caesar. And our forefathers were much taller and had blonde or red hair and quite big physique people usually because of the way they lived. Uh, I don't want to go into that because it's too dramatic, but a lot of people don't know that. If you're Australian descent, if your grandfathers come from Scotland, Wales, or England, not so much, sorry, not so much England, Anglo-Saxon, because you're a mix of French and Germans then, uh, that's through the Dark Ages, when England was dominated by the Germans and was dominated by the French, that's what English is, it's a bastardization, it's a third Latin, it's a third German, it's a third French. That is why French people and German people hate the English language, because it's an abortion of their languages, that's why they refuse to speak it. We speak a third German, a third English, a third French, and a third Latin. Think about it. Where do we go to relieve ourselves? We go to a toilet. And if you think about those words, they have that toilet, they have that French roll to them. A lot of our words are German when you think about them. I don't want to give you an English speaking language, I'm just giving you a brace. Because it's all connected to fighting. These languages were all evolved because we fought one another. And the French got stronger than somebody else, and now you'll speak French. And the Germans, we're stronger than the French, and now you'll speak German. And the Celts were way back there before Christ. And that's where just explaining where heritage comes from. 400 years ago, we went across to England, to America, because there was a potato famine in Ireland. 
There was 5 million people living on a period of time. Same population as there is today. 1.3 million people died of starvation. 1.7 million people making 4 million people, we were making 1.3 million people, and that's why you've got the Boston Celts, because we were Celts, and that's where you get the basketball team from, and a lot of wealthy people from Ireland and Scotland settled in North and High America. When we came in 200 years ago, we didn't have the aristocracy, aristocracy, but aristocracy. Aristocracy. He loves these words. Aristocracy. Haven't done that. Aristocracy, that'll do. You got that correctly? That's yes. what it be. <laughs> Where are we at? 200 years ago, Christopher Columbus came out here and said, Where are your family struggling? That's bullshit. The Dutch were here 400 years before that, and that's bullshit. The Celts were here 700 years before that. We have inscriptions now, just been found in New South Wales, that are Gaelic expressions written in northern New South Wales, which means the Celts were here 700 years ago when they were in North America. The Irish went there 400 years ago, and Christopher Columbus discovered America. The Indians have been there for a long time. What is an Indian? An Indian is a result of a Mongol and a Celt having intercourse. The Celts walked across Europe and mixed with the Mongols, and that's why you get the big physique, which is it's like guys. So there was the Celtic look and took them what we call North Americans. What is an Indian? Christopher Columbus was looking for India. He got lost in the tides. He looked through his scope. He saw a couple of guys on horses with white paint on their faces and feathers. He said, Jesus Christ is the Indians, because he thought he was the India. <laughs> <laughs> he had never seen Indians before. And when he saw the North American Indian sitting on his horse, he said, it's an Indian. So since that day, we called North American savages became known as Indians because Christopher Columbus was lost. History is funny, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He was called a digger. And we stopped the planet. We got on a ship and we went overseas to help fight against Japan and Germany. And we wore our hats stored up on one side with the badge on it. And we were the most ferocious fighters the rest of the world had seen. The American ship themselves, the Italian ship themselves, because the digger is an exceptional fighter. Do you have any reasons why we're so exceptional? I don't, except I read a history book. I got into it and I thought, Jesus Christ, they were Celts. I didn't know it because they took their heritage on us and didn't teach us. When you went to school, you don't learn about Celts, do you? And you wonder what the hell I'm talking about now and why I'm talking about it. If you have United Kingdom descendancy, I'm just trying to give you a little history lesson here. And why are we fighters? And why are you on camp? Have you wondered why you're on camp? Why aren't you in the yoga class? <laughs> why aren't you watching a local football match? You come along to camp and pay hundred or so dollars to have bruises put all over your body and no sleep. You push up and sit up for a while. Listen to a guy who raves about something good. No one even is talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> there is a reason you are here. You have Celtic genes in you. If you are an Italian or you come from Switzerland, you come from Yugoslavia, you have Celtic genes in you. Because the Celts run all of Europe before Christ. And they laid in bed with everybody. They were that kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at the northern areas, I see a few history movies are nodding their heads. Uh, they run over mostly mountainous areas, Yugoslavia, Sicilians. Have you ever wondered why all the Italians that came here on the Bob Menzies $10 ticket are all five foot two, they're all peasants, just like the guys that stole the bread. Bob Menzies said in the 1950s, after we'd had the country 150 years, I'm going to bring a whole bunch of migrants over here for $10 each. So your grandfather, some of you sitting in the room now, because you have ethnic blood in there, so why is he talking like this about the Irish and the Scottish? That's not us. I'm very small, why are you talking about us? <laughs> just a joke. It's the same thing. If you look at Sicilians, they are six foot four, weigh two kilos, and you'll see a lot of redheads. And not so much blondes, but brownish hair in northern Italy or something in Italy. Sicilian. Oh, 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 oh. You're Italian? No, I'm Italian. You're Irish, but not some bloody Irish. Yeah. No, that's what we've been talking about here. Uh, Germany is very cold. If you, go to, if you go to the museum in Germany, they've got the first Mercedes ever built. The Mercedes car that could have gone on the earth is sitting in a glass case. The oldest chariot that they have found, Celtic chariot, is in a glass case alongside of the Mercedes. Hitler has been tried to recreate the Celtic race, the Aryan race. If you read the history books, but we're talking fighting, aren't we? Why would we this? Because it's fighting. And in 1940, 1939, 1940, he tried to take the world over with a race of warriors that were all exactly six foot two, weighed 95 kilos, and had blonde hair and blue eyes. And he was killing anybody else who didn't look like that. Yep. <laughs> Um, I've lost my whole point. Well, you've been here for a couple of hundred years and, you know, you <laughs> mix with those other ones that came down for $10 and you a little bit shorter. <laughs> I put the shorts on, I put the handle supports on, I use with the hand wraps, because then I feel like a tie. I don't want to train like a tie. Now, if I want to feel Japanese, and I want to go back uh, not even 2,000 years, because Siam goes back 2,000 years, that's what we'll say in this conversation. Japan only goes back mainly to the Edo period. 
where they really started fighting and excelling was the samurai period from about the seventh century, really affected with ninjutsu to about the fifth. But in history books, most of it the seventh century up to about the sixteenth. I think he's actually died in sixteen forty-five, yeah, sixty-one years of age. A uh, hero from Japan. We have heroes from uh, Celtic times as well. Bodice, I must just mention that next year they're doing a film on Bodice. You may not have heard of her. You may not have heard of her, but she's the most famous Celtic female warrior of history. And they are spending $85 million on her life story. It will be released in 1995. Defense is very important at elbows because it's very close combat and you'll be cut or you'll be brutalized by an elbow. So before you do an elbow technique, the defense comes in first. You place the opposite hand across the top of the head this way. It's done in variations, but this is my simplicity of teaching. Turn the palm out and put the back of the wrist on your forehead. And then you do that from this stance here and you look underneath the arm if you're worried about him hitting you, he's got his left foot forward too. Can I have a fighter, please? Orthodox stance, left foot forward. I'm about to hit him with an elbow, so I'll use my defence. The danger he's got now is not so much an uppercut, because his hands are high and my elbow's down. So uppercut is not usually a problem. Here I have a problem against the left. Left jab coming into here, rolling over and hitting me here. So if I'm looking under my arm, about to hit him with this elbow, I will keep the shoulder up until I get ready to work with the elbow to minimise this space. Remember, he's got a 10 ounce glove. In Thailand, they only wear 4 ounce gloves. It's not much bigger than their fist, so they can get in quicker. In the West, we try Thai techniques, but the government won't allow us to wear 4 ounce gloves. We have to wear 10 to 12 ounce gloves. So it's a bit bigger and harder to get in. But the left hook, from there, I look, underneath, I look over the top, so I look underneath to get the shoulder up. Because I want to have vision this way, not blinded by my arm. So I've got to look under to defense against the left. If the left is missed or gone and it's wide, then the other hand right is dangerous, so I look underneath. So I can get this way here and I turn and use the elbow that way. If this becomes dangerous again, this way, that way. This way, that way. This way. So I'm about to hit with this elbow or this one. Either elbow can fire and I'm getting in position. Oh, so I'm going to do top of My fault, I'll follow you up 100%. Thank you. Um, I want either elbow to hit him and I've got to get past these forearms and as ways I can do it, but I've got to defend myself. So if that's defense against that, that's defense against that. So when we move around now, we're doing that. You know. Then we change over, we do the same thing. Try it on the reverse side. Then you change over, and from here, use the opposite hand, that way. So with the left foot forward, I'm using the right hand. Left foot forward, using the left hand. Up, underneath, down, looking over the top. It's simple, it's complex, but it's simple. As long as the hand's there. Mind if you forget everything else, just stand up with the hand there. That will give you a chance to stop the elbow from coming in. When you get good with it and you start to understand human movement, then you can start to look under, look out, bring the shoulder up, bring the shoulder down, bring the hand across, change feet, do the same thing, forward hand, forward foot, then you get real smart, forward foot, reverse hand. So you can start to really complicate it by understanding the human movement. Go as far as you can. One foot forward, the same hand forward. Looking under, looking over. If you get real good at it, try it on the other side. Reverse. When you get real good at it, change over. Opposite leg forward, forward hand, under, over, right hook, left over hand, good now opposite style, now southward, see, it would be southward. What if I was southward and he's orthodox? I've got to change it again. That's the complication. If we're both southward, that's fine. If we're both going to look forward and we're fighting like that's fine. Fight again, please. We're both right handers, so we both start with our left hand forward. That's fine. We've got a fairly good game of chess going here. It's fairly simple. It can be as complicated as we're as experienced, but we've both got the same style. It's called Orthodox. So if he changes over with his right foot forward, he makes it so complicated now. Because he's opposite to me and I'm opposite to him. If he's left-handed, he's comfortable, because that's how he does it all the time. But only one percent, only ten percent, five to ten percent of people are opposite to the norm. Ninety to ninety-five are right-handed. Five to ten percent are left-handed. Does that make sense? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just making up to go along. I mean who can't who can't can 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 I'm just going for my classes. I've been teaching for thirty years. And it seems to me about 90-95% of right-handed. So the left foot forward is the norm. And when you get in the ring and watch kickboxing, usually the left foot's forward. <coughs> Boxing, same thing. Usually the left foot's forward. Because 90% are right-handed. So 90% are always doing the same thing. 90% are always comfortable with one another. But these 5%, 5 to 10% babies who were born on the other side to us, they do everything on the other side. That's comfortable for him 100% of the time. So he's used to doing it against me 100% of the time. I only see him 10% of the time. I don't like that. So I try and fight the same style as him. 
Now he's got the advantage because he's real good at this because that's his natural side. This is his power side. This is not my power side. This is. And I like it from behind. Body behind. And see, up front it's okay, but it's not as strong. It's even, even with body movement. If I put it over, now it's powerful. That's his power shot. So if I change over to mimicking, boom. So what do I do against the South Pole fighter? I change as much as I can to try and make it confusing for him. That's the only thing I can do with her. And I work around this side here because that's his good hand. So I wouldn't work this way too much because if he lets that go, I'm in trouble. So what I'll do is I'll fox and change style. I'll keep annoying him by going this way. Now he's probably done a development for that by working on his switch kick. Because he goes, when we find the opposite side, they work this way because Bob Jones told them that. So I'm going to work on a switch kick on this side. So that's what makes it interesting when you play chess. That's why you're here not watching football. Let's try that defense, please, nothing else. And nothing was new, it was all copied from other races, from uh, Okinawans and from Okinawan stocks of the Egyptians. And the Egyptians were the venture at the beginning from the race that people called the Celts. So we've been talking about quite a bit. That's what's been starting the last time we came. So uh, nothing's original. It all goes back, and uh, it, most of it was taken from animals. There's a series called Face in the Mob or Face in the Crowd, it's one of my favorite television shows. It's a series on Channel 2. You can buy it for about $58. I think that's what the world spends an interesting, interesting one to talk about right now. Uh, facing the mob or facing the crowd is uh, it's about kangaroos. And uh, it is so cult and so Aboriginal and so North American Indian that uh, if you have any interest in those cultures, you will love facing the crowd, which is very special of kangaroos. There's no speaking because kangaroos can't speak. But uh, you see a kangaroo being born, and it's about two inches long from the wound he crawls up into the, into the pouch. And then you see him drop the six foot two tall, and you see him eventually attempt to take the tribe over. And he's not successful the first time. He goes away and has weight training for two years where they go and train like the Celtics to train. And miraculously, if you see the film, he comes back 20, 30 kilos heavier and more muscle down than what he was when you see him when he gets done by the old man the first time. The old man beats him the first time because they submit by coughing rather than doing this or what down. And kangaroos actually cough. And when women come on heat, that means they desire intercourse to make new babies and female kangaroos control birth. They have five females and they have one male. That's why there's more women than men. So once a year when the women come on heat, of course there's ten times more women than what there are men and the men go into fisticuffs. So they train and they fight one another because the best fighter with all the girls. Normally the best fighter will reign for many years supreme, into the oldest and the wisest. And each year as he goes around and challenges all the young butts, he walks up and he covers his mouth politely and he coughs. Like that. And the young bucks, there's always a little bit of that uh, you think of. And you see this on film, kangaroo looks the way. This young kangaroo that we've seen born and we're watching growing up, there comes a the time where he decides to challenge the old man. Now challenge the old man by looking back in his eyes and <coughs> cocking back again. That means they will fight to the death and the winning is all the girls. That's the cult of the kangaroo. The first time he doesn't make it, but he coughs and he submits and the old man lets him go. Probably the old man can stay. The young man goes away, we don't see him for about two years, we don't know where he goes because the camera stayed on the herd and he just popped off to rest and he thought, oh well, when they get beat up they must pop off and go and live on their own. But no, they go away and train fanatically, religiously. And we don't know what they do, but they come back 30 or 40 kilos, kilos heavy. I'm not exactly when you see the film you don't mind drive, because that's what it did to me. He's got traps, he looks like he's gone away and done a full session on steroids. And uh, he fights the old man at the next time, they come in and he coughs, and the young one coughs again, and the old man he got a bit chilly, too, he got even cough again. And they fight twice as ferocious. And you see the whole fight on the special. They fight. And you see the skin ripped off, and you see the ears hanging off, and you see the blood. I don't know if it's month, but they're all repaired for each fight. That's how it works in a while. And when they fight the second time, the old man is not doing so good, so he decides to flip a coin and split the herd. The film finishes with the young buck down like this one, and the old man going away with uh, 20 girls each, if they're one way and 40 girls. The girls are all on heat, waiting for the fight to finish, and that's the end of the show. I explain this because it's very tight. You'll be freaked out, this class I'm about to do for you. It is so tight, and that's what fascinated me. Besides the muscular, the muscularity, besides the psychology, not that I'm a green, I'm actually a red person, so it's not my job to say the green paint, it's other people's jobs, they have different colors for personality. I'm a red person, so that's not my job. But I like teaching people about a little bit more red awareness about them. Stephen Dobbs will teach you about the yellow, and some people will teach you about the blue. But uh, does it make sense what I'm saying? I'm that, let's see here. The kangaroos, he's so tired. They fight with the hands hanging down, and they rock from foot to foot, and then they sit on the tail, and they throw a front kick, which is identical to the tie boxes, 
And uh, from when they get in, they put one hand around the back of the head and they take all the wrists and they hold the top of the head and they twist the elbows in the shoulders of one another. Because I'm tired trained, oh my God, who put these guys by boxing? And all the time, I realised that centuries ago, some old fire must have laid in a study for kangaroos and was like a press by the way they fought. This is where the kangaroos were still in Europe. They were in Europe before the water came across. They weren't born in Australia. They came down from Central Europe just like the Kelsey and the Aboriginals. They weren't born in Australia either. They came down 70 years ago. At this point, if you cut this here, they think Adam and Eve were about 8,500 years ago. But now the Aboriginals were maybe even before Adam and Eve. It would be a different story. But then here we have proof of 70,000 years. We have proof of Celts being in Australia 1700 BC. We have proof of Dutch being here 800 years ago, 600 years ago. So Christopher Columbus didn't really discover Australia like the English world of life to the roof. And we've been fighting here, I've discussed it because the Aboriginals also have been interesting people. We've been here for 70,000 years, and you know, they had the boomerangs, they were throwing up on the other, and they could take a kangaroo's head off the hundred metres and catch the bird, catch the bird, the boomerang, and came back. Not today, they can't, they've lost it. You were looking at it, going, oh, wow, well, they couldn't do that. But you know, we have markings in caves, the stories have been told that they could throw a hundred more, they'd get off the kangaroo and catch it and came back. Now it's like we kill a rabbit, but it won't come back. We kill the rabbit and fall alongside them because we've lost the talent of the aerodynamics of the spinning and going out, creating the dynamics and coming in and spinning back so you can catch it in the other hand. Can you imagine the fascination of these dumb, arrogant, ignorant, nomad people? That's what we think of them, and they can't hold a big bottle of wine and Imagine the human coming down from person. He first saw man flying in a helicopter. What do you think he thought? Two boomerangs with a man in it. I mean, that's what the Aboriginal thought when he saw a bird and he saw a helicopter because he'd had that technology for 70,000 years. We're so smart. Okay. Now you look at fighting today and going, I don't want to know it's my boxing because it's different than the time. I don't want to know it's my boxing because it's different than the time. That is really a stupid thought to have in your head. Especially if you watch the film, The Face in the Mob. Credit. Face in the Credit. Um, you can hire it for $5, you don't want to pay $68 for it, you can wait till it comes back on Channel 2, they play it five times already, because every time they play it, they get 30,000 letters, and there's only 5% watch list for this on Channel 2, so they don't have that rating anyway, they don't know where the letters come from, so they play it again. There's only 5% of the market, so they wonder why they get some of the letters. It's very, very popular. If you can't wait for it on TV, rent it. Uh, or like myself, I'm going to watch it. I think one can't bring it down so we can watch it. I told you all that story because I think that's how I watched it. We came through from Europe 100,000 years ago, or a million years ago, whenever it was that we were there before the report between us. Maybe four or five million years ago. Maybe through the other side of the world. Stand up. The way the kangaroos walk before they start using their tail is that they really block between the left and the left of the balance. Trying to the body and fit with it. The second one coming around, because you're in close, you don't use the feet so much, but you use the hips like playing tennis or playing golf. We hear a little bit there. Imagine I'm a tennis player. Imagine I'm a golfer. It's pretty much the same sort of flow on a roundhouse. So you're using the buttocks and the knee and the heel. But they have the heel pointing in the same line as the knee and the heel pointing at the guy you're hitting and come around. If you're hitting the chin, <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> if you're hitting the chin and you're coming around, come down as you hit, as you hit, twist it down. Because if you aim at the bottom of the corners of the mouth, where the corners of the mouth are, you're aiming there, on the round one. On the upper cut, you're aiming into there and pushing in between the ears. So from here, I'm aiming under there and pushing out as well as coming up. So I'm hitting and going up and into between the ears. That's in my mind, driving my elbow up on that angle there. Or I go for more speed and keep the contact less when you jump to the chin, directly under the center of the chin that way. I'm trying to replace the back of the neck now, rather than drive in right through to knock him out. So he's here, and I'm thinking about all of his teeth disappearing, because of his mouth guard in. That way. Coming around, I'm aiming at the line of the mouth, right there. And if I'm smart, I will hit it and the ridge. And the ridge there, as I hit the jaw, I'll reach it down. This content I learned this for vocal stretch amps in the street body. If you can punch guys and come down on that chin spot, he's tall, six foot four, and we used to punch down on the chin rather than up or across. This round of also is not very nice at the jaw hinge here. When you have the hinge for the jaw to work up and down, hitting the elbow here is not very nice either. And also the 
temples. So we don't do the temples that tend to go higher and use a round one. Depending on what. If you're really tall, you can do anything. <laughs> uh, the job is up here, around and down. Or straight into the hinge, not down, in and up if anything onto the hinge. So if you go into the hinge below the ear, hit in and go up. Makes sense? It's, 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 when you think about it, you feel it. The chin come down. If you want to go to the temple, come up on the toes and bring the feet together. Then come down, just step forward. That would be the result that we got here. And then that was underneath. You catch the elbow, bring the feet together, and get your maximum height. So the feet together from here, okay, you go up, that's your maximum height. Now at that point, either foot can go forward, whether it be a free range or in a situation that happens. From this point, you can use the left foot and come down, or from this point, you can use the right foot and come down. Left foot probably slightly better balance, depending if you start to move that way. If you start to move that way, I'll chase you with the right leg. Make sense? Get them to the cameras that way. Otherwise, from here, you can get all sorts of problems there. The point is, maximum height on the attack. A lot of us try and do it from here. If it doesn't get in. They do it in self defense, in a strict situation. They don't know how to use their elbows properly, and a right hand can use vice. Boom, because it extends. And you've got the movement there, you've got the hip extension and the shoulder extension and this movement here. But on an elbow, it's very short, it's not that long, when you go there, it's not that something from there to there. So really, if you try it without moving the back foot, and you wonder why you can't hit the right, well, you just put them and it bounces off. You bring the back foot up and raise, and then step and come down. See what I did? Back foot came in, my body came up, as the elbow came up, and then I come down, so I go forward. That's what I want you to try doing now, moving around. So when you do the uppercut, that way, when you do the round one, you come across, that way you're going to the mouth line, or the jaw hinge. If you want the temple or the eyebrow at the top of the head, the thighs come up with this, and they'll get up to here, and they'll come down that way. That's a nasty one as well. Another extension. It's like my favourite shot. I did that. I've done this three times in a row now. Did the reverse shot? I did that one. I did, I did yeah, the one yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, the one that works for me, I had to go and go into fire. Boom, I used to put a punch or anything. Boom, back with this. Yeah? He's had to do That sends a shot right through your body with that, that jarring hit there. The tide will come up to here, or to this point here. Then I'll take the hand right up and come down that way. Instead of going from there, same thing, I'll bring it down that way. And just the way it hits and comes there, which is a reach at the top of the head, you know when you're born, you notice the head pulsates here? That remains there forever. It's not as strong as the rest of your skull, even in the middle age. You still have a slight, yeah, compared to... Got a hammer So the tires come up and come down here. And it cuts. It's skin might be a little bit softer, I don't know. Didn't check with the doctor to get on it, and I don't know if they know either. Except it's more tender when you're born, and it stays that way as you're older. The skull's not as strong right there, so I guess the skin's more sensitive. Because I see the tide, they make ugly cuts across here. And it gushes down. You see the long thing he stayed in, because life's very cheap over there. You saw the film Kickboxer, it was pretty close. Fairly humorous, but it was pretty close to the facts as well. Put it on a stretch around the back alley, and they didn't get dead. That's pretty close to it. Um, Cross. Now, the other three. 